In movies, it's pretty common to see one guy, usually the main character, beat up 10 people all at once. That is just how movies work. But it's not how real life works, right? Well, usually it isn't. However, there are times in history where one person has overcome the odds and managed to win despite being vastly outnumbered. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Pierre Armand Gaston Bilot was a man who made it happen. With a single tank of his own, he managed to destroy 13 German tanks and take back the village of Stone. It sounds like something out of a movie or a video game, only it really happened. This extraordinary feat of tank commanding happening during the Battle of Stone. The Nazis had taken the village of Stone. Their original plan had been to have a faint south and make it look like they were going to go behind the Magnol Line. This would hide their true intention, which was the thrust straight for the channel. Nazi leadership went back and forth on this plan, but eventually went through with it. So the 10th Panzer Division, along with the Grob Deutschland Infantry Regiment, weren't sent to attack Stone. Stone was and is a tiny town that almost nobody actually lived in. It was really more like a small farming commune than an actual village. It was an irrelevant, innocuous town that was suddenly one of the most dangerous places to be on the Western Front. The village changed hands a total of 17 times over the course of just three days of fighting between May 15 and May 17 in 1940. The generals must have gotten whiplash just trying to keep track of what was happening in the little town that had unexpectedly become a crucial battlefield. Operations near the little town of Stone continued to build up until it involved 90,000 German troops, 300 German tanks, 42,500 French soldiers, and 130 French tanks. This completely dwarfed the original citizen population of Stone. The Nazis would end up suffering 26,500 casualties in Stone and losing 24 tanks. The French would only lose 7,500 men, but 33 tanks. The three-day battle was vicious and intense. It was the only battle where the Nazis would come face to face with the best tank the French had to offer, the Char B-1Bs. This was the tank that Pierre Bellot had at his command. The Char B-1 was a tank that was designed specifically to be a breakthrough vehicle. It was originally just going to be a self-propelled gun that had a 75mm howitzer in the hull, but then later, a 47mm gun and a turret was added. This allowed it to function as a battle tank that could fight enemy armor. It was developed before World War II broke out, beginning all the way back in the early 1920s. It had a troubled production. Its development and production were delayed over and over again. The result of this process was a vehicle that was technologically complex and very expensive to make. The Char B-1 was among the most powerfully armed and most heavily armored tanks of its day. It proved to be very effective in direct battles with German tanks. However, it did have its downsides. All that armor and firepower made it really slow, and it also got terrible mileage. You don't really think of something like mileage as being important for military vehicles. It's not like anybody is going to be commuting in them, but in World War II, gasoline wasn't always easy to come by, and it had to be rationed carefully. So a tank that was slow and went through a lot of fuel fast like the Char B-1 just wasn't really cut out for the fast-moving war that World War II ended up becoming. When France was defeated and Germany took over, they found some uses for the Char B-1s they had captured. Some were rebuilt with flamethrowers, and others were used as mechanized artillery. The Char B-1Bs that Pierre fought with was actually an upgraded version of the original Char B-1. It had thicker armor that was 60 millimeters thick in the front and 55 millimeters thick at the sides. It had an APX-4 turret with a longer barreled gun, giving it real anti-tank fighting capacities. The top speed of the B-1Bs was only 16 miles per hour. That isn't that bad when you consider that it weighed 31.5 tons. It had an operational range of about 110 miles. It could drive at 12 miles per hour for six hours. Not exactly a vehicle that would be ideal for road trips. If you wanted to take Char B-1Bs anywhere, you would need to bring a lot of additional fuel with you. There were armored vehicles that were specifically designed to help them refuel quickly. Only 11 Char B-1s are still around today. This was the tank that Pierre rode into battle. It proved to be extremely effective against German tanks. In fact, it was practically invulnerable or at least Pierre's tank was anyway. He survived 140 hits from German anti-tank guns. The Char B-1's armor, which was so heavy that it couldn't even go the speed limit in a suburb, really paid off. The Char B-1B's guns also paid off. Pierre destroyed a total of 13 German tanks. Two of these were Panzer IVs, and 11 were Panzer III's. He also managed to destroy a bunch of anti-tank guns. 
Through a combination of tactical brilliance, having the perfect weapon for the situation, and luck, Pierre somehow won the 1 vs. 13 battle. The official name of his main opponent, the Panzer III, was actually the Panzer Kampfwagen III. But nobody has time to say all that during a battle. It was a medium-sized tank that the Nazis used very extensively in World War II, like the Char B-1. It was mainly intended to fight other armored vehicles. It was designed to be used alongside the Panzer IV, which was originally for infantry support. How did Pierre manage to take out 11 of these things? Well, while they were designed to fight other tanks, the Panzer III was not as sturdy as the Char B-1. The original Panzer III models had only 15 millimeters of armor on all sides and only 10 millimeters of armor on the top. The Nazis quickly realized that this wasn't going to cut it, and so later models were upgraded to have 30 millimeters of armor on the front, sides, and rear. This was double the armor of the earlier models, but it was still nowhere near as fortified as the Char B1s. I know which tank I'd rather be in if I was going to get blasted by a giant anti-tank gun. In terms of firepower, the Panzer III was initially designed with a 50 millimeter gun in mind. But since the infantry at the time was being equipped with 37mm guns, the Nazis decided to give the Panzer III 37mm guns as well for the sake of standardization. The turret ring was made large enough to accommodate a 50mm gun in the future though, and this ended up being the reason the Panzer III stuck around. Since that upgrade to 50mm ended up being necessary as the Nazis began to face more and more heavily armored opponents. Like many once great vehicles, the Panzer III was eventually overshadowed by the Panzer IV. By 1942, the Panzer IV was becoming Germany's main medium tank because of its superior upgrade potential. The Panzer III, however, remained in production as a close support vehicle for the Panzer IV. If the Panzer III outclassed Pierre Char B1 in any way, it was mobility. The Panzer III was powered by a 12-cylinder Maybach HL108 TR engine. Yes, that's the same Maybach that makes cars for rappers today. The Panzer III had a top speed of 25 miles per hour, Still not very fast, but faster than the sluggish Char B1s. This superior speed clearly didn't help them much in this particular battle, however. The Battle of Stone was close quarters, and so they really didn't have any opportunity to try and outmaneuver Pierre. Pierre was probably motivated to win at all costs because the battle was a very big deal. It was of huge importance. Stone was just a small town, but it was also situated on high ground overlooking Sedan. This gave it a lot of strategic significance. The French needed it as a base from which they could launch long-term attacks on Sedan. The French infantry was slow getting to Stone, and so the armor outran them and got there first. The tanks tried to attack alone and failed. Stone was being held by the Nazi and 1st Battalion Grub Deutschland, and only nine of the regiment's 12 anti-tank artillery guns. The French continued to press forward and the weak German defense struggled to hold their ground. However, when a German platoon managed to destroy three Char B1s, most of the French tank crews were not as badass as Pierre panicked and drove off to the south in a retreat. This was a big psychological victory for the Nazis, and it proved to them that they would in fact be able to hold on to the town. France launched more attacks and control of Stone went back and forth. However, in the end, despite Pierre's odds-defying efforts, the Nazis kept control of Stone. The 10th Panzer Division sent its 1st Battalion in as support, and the Germans were able to take back Stone for good. France's defeat here left Belgium with basically no protection on their flank. Things really started to break down after this point in the war. Many French soldiers were taken prisoner before they could even offer any resistance. This was kind of good in that it meant there were less casualties, but it also meant that France was losing fast. The battle at Sedan was the nail in the coffin for France and Belgium. Pierre would go on to have a long and distinguished career, he was imprisoned by the German military, but escaped and was appointed by the Free French Government in exile to be head of the French military mission to Moscow. He was the chief of staff for Charles de Gaulle, who chaired the provisional government. After the Allied invasion of France, he fought with the 2nd Armored Division. Later, he would be put in command of the 10th Division. After France was eventually liberated from Nazi control, he became assistant chief of staff of the French Army. After he retired from active military service, he served as Minister of National Defense and as Minister of Overseas Departments and Territories. Clearly, his skills went beyond just commanding tanks. If you enjoyed this video, you can like it down below. You can also subscribe if you'd like to see more. Thanks for watching.